Nobody wants to be that guy, and it's really easy to be that guy when you're a new pilot or a low time pilot. And so this video, I'm gonna show you ways how to avoid that. But it really has deeper implications, and it's not just for vanity's sake that we wanna you know, look like an experienced pilot, but I think there's a much uh, deeper kind of undertone here of safety and learning ways to exhibit uh, behaviors uh, of really experienced pilots, even if you're new or you have a low amount of time. I've got about 700 hours, so I'd still say I'm a pretty low time pilot, but I'm kind of getting the middle ground where I've got some experience. But I've been trying to mimic kind of the behaviors of those much more experienced than me uh, in an effort really to be more safe. And so today I want to cover four of those common denominators that I see more experienced pilots exhibiting uh, so we can start to do that too and not be that guy. So let's dive right in. The first behavior we can exhibit is conservative decision making. And I think you can further break this down into two areas, the go, no go decision, do I fly in the first place, and then in-flight decision making, and we'll cover a few in both. The first part of go, no go decision making is developing personal minimums. And so a lot of these have to do with weather. So two personal minimums that I have are kind of gusts, so the wind gusts, and then IFR minimums. And you can develop these over time, uh, mine certainly have. And so where they are today, as far as gusts go, I really don't like flying in gusts over 30 knots. Um, at that point, it's just not fun really at all. Uh, once it gets you know mid and upper 20s, it's starting to really get my attention. I feel comfortable and proficient and safe in that environment, but over 30, uh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna be flying. Um, you know, but there was a time when it was 10 or 15 knots, right? Or particularly in tailwheel. I, I mean, if it was if it was mid-teens, I mean, that, that really, really got my attention and that was a personal minimum. So that can change over time. Mine certainly have. Um, as far as IFR goes, you know, my, my kind of approach on this, pardon the pun, is uh, really looking at it as a whole package. So, uh, for example, if where I'm going is socked in IFR, but you know not that far away is really good weather, then I, you know, I'm fine doing an approach down to minimums, right? But if the entire area is socked in, and I know anywhere I'm going to go, even if it's an alternate, is all going to be IFR, I really don't like flying in anything under, under you know 500 feet of cloud. Uh, ceilings and such just because I want to have a buffer there even if it's at an alternate I don't like flying where the entire area is low IFR down to minimums right now I'm just not quite comfortable doing that so that's kind of where I'm at today maybe it'll give you some ideas of where you'd like to start the second component of conservative decision making is aeromedical factors and this is something that I've really been learning uh, over the course of time you know you might be familiar with the acronym I'm safe and um, I wouldn't say that I like go through that checklist specifically but uh, I, it's something I'm really becoming more aware of of just not always assuming that me physically emotionally etc that I'm good to go fly and so in fact yesterday I scrubbed a flight um, just there was a lot of my mind I was stressed out about work and just doing a lot of things and I just didn't feel comfortable going and flying and filming a video because I knew that mentally I, I just I couldn't be all there I couldn't be on the ball like I needed to be to have a safe flight and so if that checklist is helpful definitely use it the I'm safe checklist but I think just developing more awareness for how you are going to be performing as a pilot is a really really good habit to start and not just assume that all the time across the board I'm gonna feel great to fly that day uh, in the mission I need to go accomplish don't have that as your starting point having as a starting point to run through that checklist checklist and think, okay, the flight looks good, the airplane looks good, everything looks good, am I good? So don't leave yourself out of that equation. And the last part of the go, no go decision, in, in my opinion, and I think this is the most important thing, is avoiding get there-itis mentality, right? Kind of the syndrome that you develop to say, I need to get to my destination or go experience this flight no matter what. No matter what the weather is, no matter what the aeromedical factors might be, uh, throwing caution to the wind, I'm going. And um, this can be a really hard thing to just ground a flight if enough things aren't adding up to where it makes sense to fly. And so don't be committed, just like, you know, I don't think you should be committed to the flight from an aeromedical personal perspective, um, you know, without kind of going through that checklist. I don't think you should also be committed to the flight uh, and kind of the get there itis mentality. Uh, you just really need to be open handed and open minded about whether or not the flight is going to occur as planned that day. And so that's just a skill I think you develop over time. And, and it's a bummer to scrub a flight. It sucks. Uh, but it, it's something that that can be safe in the right decision. So Leave that as part of uh, your decisions and as part of the options to actually scrub a flight. Don't have get there itis. 
And the second part of conservative decision making is in-flight decision making. And personally, I think I can boil this down to really two key areas. The first is slowing down. And this doesn't necessarily mean with your airspeed, but just slow down yourself. Have time to go through the checklist. Don't force uh, an approach if you're not ready for it. Don't you know try to tuck yourself into a tight uh, pattern to get in front of other airplanes. I did this in Idaho once uh, and learned that at high density altitude is very hard to descend quickly and also lose airspeed. And I got in a uh, a situation I really, really didn't like. It all turned out okay, but it really uh, opened my eyes to not rushing things in the pattern. And so slow down. And the second thing is communicating. And that can be even just communicating with yourself just internally and, and making sure you're aware of everything you're doing, all the procedures, all the checklists. It could be communicating with a co-pilot or an instructor and being very clear about what we're doing and why. Or it could also include talking to other aircraft or ATC, which is a nice transition to our next section. So the second area that you can behave like a more experienced pilot is in air traffic control communications, talking with ATC or with other aircraft. And I think I can boil this down really to two areas. The first is knowing what to expect. So sometimes we can get jumbled up on the radio um, in how we respond or what we say in the first place just because you know we're maybe not as familiar with the flow of things or maybe we're a little rusty. And this is a really easy thing to correct. If we're coming into a non-towered airport, just really being crisp on those calls, knowing what to expect in terms of how the, how the pattern is going to work with other airplanes in it, what calls am I going to need to make? If you're coming into to, you know, controlled airspace, just knowing, hey, what, what information do they need from you, right? What are they likely going to have you do uh, based off of where you're at and what your intentions are? So just trying to think a few steps ahead, and this is really helpful in instrument flying, I think will make you much more confident and much more proficient on the radio. Just having in mind and always knowing what to expect. They could throw you some curveballs, but at least have an idea of what's probably about to happen. And the second way to be effective with air traffic control is to have very clear communication. And I don't just mean from like a cadence perspective. Yeah, you want to sound very clear and crisp, but I think more just being very clear about your intentions. So if it's uncontrolled airspace or non-towered non airport, um, you know, being very clear about your position and your intentions. So many people omit, go, go listen for this next time you're at a non-controlled uh, or non-towered airport and you'll, you'll notice this. People will, you know, leave out the runway that they're landing on or they'll just call base. They'll say, yeah, we're on base for the runway. They won't even say what runway runway or if they're left base or right base. They'll say we're on the downwind. Was it left downwind or right downwind? Be very clear about where you are and what your intentions are. It's very easy to get lazy on this uh, and it's something that's very easy to avoid. And then when we're talking to actual controllers, uh, you want to similarly be very clear about you know your position and your intentions. But then also, uh, I think one really helpful thing to do is to evaluate what they're telling you to do because they're human and they make mistakes also. So if you get a call, you're expecting you know a, a left uh, left turnout uh, for a departure, but it, it makes a lot more sense to have a, a right. Uh, downwind departure or something based off of kind of your direction of flight and the flow of the airport, speak up. I've been in that situation multiple times. Um, and, and so just be very clear about uh, about communicating and it'll help you be a lot more proficient uh, with air traffic control. I've put together two different videos that I think might be helpful uh, in this regard. One is five mistakes to stop making with ATC. Uh, and then the other one, which is much longer, I think, uh, uh, really helpful video is 15 ways to get better at air traffic control right now. And they aren't just kind of pie in the sky ideas. They're very actionable things um, that I've thought a whole lot about. So I hope it'll, hope it'll be helpful for you. Definitely go check those out. A third thing we can do to behave as a more experienced pilot is to have humility and not be afraid to ask questions. One of the things we commonly do as humans when we don't want to reveal that we're not very experienced in something is we stop talking. We stop asking questions because we don't want to accidentally uh, let someone know that, oh, you, you didn't already know that? You didn't know something about that? And so uh, it's something really, really easy as a new pilot uh, to just stop asking questions because we're afraid of being judged by others. And uh, I, I'm just really trying to fight that and not be afraid to ask my mechanic some question that I feel like I should have known 
long time ago uh, because the, the reality is my safety is on the line here. If I don't ask this question or I don't speak up or I don't understand something better. And so uh, I'll be the first to start asking stupid questions uh, and uh, make sure that I know something because I, I, I don't want to fall into that trap. And I want to have humility and not think that I know everything and just act like a hot shot. So I hope you'll join me in that. Let's all try to ask questions whether or not we think we should already know them. Um, man, it's just better to ask it and that will help us become even more experienced in the process. And the last way we can behave like an experienced pilot is to find ways to continue our learning. I think the best pilots are the ones who are always kind of growing their knowledge base, growing their uh, experiences to help them be a more rounded pilot. So this can be, you know, getting more ratings, getting your next license. It can be going to explore new places. Uh, it can be reading, you know, really good books. I know for me right now, one of my last videos, I talked about something I'm working on is my mechanical knowledge about engines and systems and uh, malfunctions and troubleshooting and stuff like that. So I bought a 400 page book on the recommendation of a lot of you commenting out there. Thank you. This is Engines by Mike Bush. It is over 400 pages long. I'm 10% of the way through it and I've already learned a ton. And so um, just finding ways to really dive in and try to continue your learning, I think will help you not be complacent and help us uh, act like a more experienced pilot and also become one in the process. So I think the common denominator of all of these things is safety. It's not just vanity to try to act like a more experienced pilot and fool people into thinking you're better than you are. It's none of that. It's actually becoming a safer pilot and that helps you become a more experienced pilot. So I hope it gives you some things maybe to work on. I know it's things that I certainly am. And in fact, if you'd like to know specifically what I'm working on as a 700 hour pilot, in case you missed it, I put that video together. Uh, and But what I love most about that video is not the video itself, it's actually the comment section of that video. Uh, we have a really cool discussion going on talking about the things that we're learning and things we're working on. I've learned a lot from you guys, so I hope you'll go watch that video and then chime in the discussion. So hope to see you guys over there, but thanks again for watching today. I hope it makes you a safer pilot.